Hi, I'm Jeff Gonzalez, president of Trident Concepts. And today I'm here with AR15.com for a Navy SEAL roasting Navy SEALs. All right, so a little background about this movie. First of all, I was actually on active duty on the East Coast when this movie was being filmed as well as being released. Uh, actually, I think I was deployed when it was released. So it's interesting because I can look at the film and actually see teammates that I know. I can actually look at the film and see kind of like certain locations that they were at that were, you know, in, in the know back then. So it's kind of an interesting look back at history. Um, it's first and foremost, it is a recruiting video. And so everybody's always just sharpshooting the hell out of it. And I honestly don't care because it did accomplish a very specific goal, which is get people interested in joining the Navy. So there's a couple scenes in the movie that I actually like, I favor. They're kind of like, hmm, I dig them. They're kind of cool. And there's some historical perspective behind this movie as well that I'll kind of like touch base on as we go through this. And, of course, it would not be a roasting video if we didn't make fun of some of the stuff that's in there. So I'm going to make fun of that in spades simply because as a team guy making fun of team guys playing, not, not really team guys, it's fun. What can I say? All right, so the first scene is what I like to call the G.I. Joe Halo Jump. So if you know anything about the movie, you know that these guys are going to be doing a Halo Jump into, or Halo Jump into, um, you know, bad guy land to try to rescue some HVT that they're going to then extract information from. So one of the things that I always talk about is first, I mean the scene is legit. A lot of those guys that are jumping uh, did all of that for real. Granted they had a lot of crap on, granted they didn't pre-breathe, granted they had stuff set up the wrong way. All of that is true, no doubt, but it's kind of hard to also, you know, like give them a hard time when a lot of the stuff they did was actually pretty pretty spot on. Um, you know, when you're jumping at high altitude and you're actually deploying your parachute so high up that you're above the horizon, it is one of the coolest things that you can ever do. You literally jump out in broad daylight and then you land in total darkness. So yeah, it's pretty cool when you're so high up that you can see the curvature of the earth. I mean, come on, who doesn't want that? And it's also pretty cool to know that you're jumping out at the same altitude that commercial airliners are actually flying intercontinental. So that's cool. Um, some of the things that I kind of have to give him, have to give him shit for is the fact that there's like no pre-breathing at all in this film. But why would they? It would be totally boring because pre-breathing is like, <laughs> it's like a form of torture on land for us. You have to sit on the tarmac for hours before you can actually start to ascend at altitude. And then if at any point you do anything to break that seal, you gotta start all over. So you do not wanna be that guy that breaks the seal during the pre-breathing. That is a very bad thing. You know, one of the other things that I was kind of laughing at was um, just looking at all the all the old school gear and it's, it's easy to make fun of now, but like that's the gear that I grew up on. That's the gear that I use. That's the gear that I was, you know, deployed with and went into combat with. So. Uh, maybe I'm a little biased in some of it, but nonetheless, it's still pretty cool. Um, let's see. My favorite is when you uh, when you find the one guy who is deathly afraid of jumping out of airplanes, because everybody there's there's always going to be that one guy. Some guys really dig it, some guys don't dig it. There's always going to be that one guy who is like, yeah, I don't like doing this at all. So let's see, which is the guy that I think it is? It's probably the guy that's already fully kitted up and everything. He just doesn't like being in the, uh, in, you know, like in the scene of sorts, making ready. Yeah, and when you crack your seal like that, you've just screwed everybody over. So anyhow, all right, these guys are going to jump out and they're going to do a bunch of relative work. They're going to fly together, which is typical. They're going to do all that kind of cool stuff. And I'm not going to lie, I love doing that. That was a perk of the job when you got a chance to jump out of an aircraft and do all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, this is the scene that I was talking about when you're so high up you actually can see the sun, you're actually above the horizon, and it's just wicked, wicked cool. Of course, um, you know, that's it's not an easy thing to do as well. So, alright, here we go. We do the little waddle to the ramp, we're gonna jump out. Funny story about the ramp. First time you have to do your jump, um, you have to jump out backwards. You literally have to kind of like exit the aircraft without actually seeing where you're going. And um, 
It's not normal. Well, first, it's not normal to jump out of an airplane, but that in and of itself is not normal. So that's a little, uh, it's a little awkward to say the least. I always tell the story of the first jump that I made. My chaser, who is the guy that's going to run you down in case you don't pull your own parachute, um, as I was the first jumper, first stick, first pass, kind of leans in and tells me a joke, which to this day I still cannot remember. I have no clue what he said. And then as I start to laugh at the joke, he just pushed me out of the airplane. And before I knew it, I'm out of the aircraft, and I'm looking at the tail, and I'm thinking, hmm, it was actually pretty cool. All right, I could do this. But they don't tell you that the first jump is actually the easy jump because the hard jump is the second one where you actually know what you're getting into and now you've got to do it again. That's where it gets fun. All right, so here, here they are. They're doing all their relative work. And, you know, again, for, that, for, the, for the time period, you got to give credit. That's actually pretty good, you know, the way they're doing it because, you know, it takes a lot of, a lot of work to get to that level where you can actually fly together as a group and you can all do your things and... Blah, 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 blah. There's um, the scene that I kind of like to joke about, which is the scene where they couldn't get anybody to really do a full cutaway into the water, so they had to rig it with a, like a test dummy, and it's so obvious. This is like the one part that I have to just like, oh, there he is. He's got a streamer, and like he's not doing well. Streamers are not good. Very bad. Um, it's also really kind of hard to cut away a slow speed malfunction because it's slow enough, it's happening slow enough that you can actually think about what you're doing and realize that, oh my god, I'm about to die. So here it is, and that's nothing more than G.I. Joe and a rope. So anyhow, that's the halo scene or the hey-ho scene. They all kind of float into the water, which is, uh, that's a lot of fun too. All right, let's move on to the next scene. All right, so... In this scene, this is another one of those scenes where there's some pretty cool stuff happening there. you got to kind of take a step back and realize that, you know, if you have any insight into what it takes to make a Hollywood movie, you realize that there's a lot of takes, a lot of angles they have to set up, a lot of repeats of everything that you just did over and over and over again. So when you watch some of these scenes, you can kind of like get a feel for like, oh man, these guys actually really did a pretty decent job of, you know, how they bound from one piece of cover to the next piece of cover. So in this, in this particular scene, um, the LT gets shot and they have to go and do a down man rescue, but um, they have to go back into the field of fire. So, Paul, let's play this clip. So here, you know, everybody's beating feet, trying to get out of the danger zone, and it's ugly. It's, everybody's shooting at them from all different angles, and so there's, like, chaos, mass chaos. But what I really like about this scene was, like, the... Um, the ability to lay down cover fire for movement. So this was a pretty good depiction of that, where you know there's communication to the rest of the team. Hey, lay down some cover fire as I bound forward to the next piece of cover. They do so, then they do the whole thing again, and that allows the um, team member to actually bound ahead under some thin veil of protection to get up to the down man to be able to um, medevac him out. And that's not an easy thing. So here, here we go as we watch, give a good communication about where he wants the fire to go so that he can get up. And I mean, after all, it is his ass that's on the line as he has to try to haul ass to get all the way up there. And here's the thing that I tell people. It's like, listen, if you're running, you're not going to be able to return fire, which is why I really like this movie, because he's not trying to. That's one of the good things about this. Is like, unlike any other Hollywood movie, you would see him running forward into a blaze of glory, shooting as he did so. Not a good idea. Instead, he uses his team members that are in a better position to actually return fire. And um, yeah, close quarters, all this fun stuff. You know, the other thing too, man, oh my God, you're like in oh, all those concrete buildings and oh, the, the sound, the noise, all the crazy that's happening. It is painful. It's painful, I'm telling you right now. All right, so now we've got a little bit of a uh, of a break here as we approach our down man, recover our down man, and of course the most cheesiest line you could possibly utter in a film is uttered right here. All right, so again. That's a real body that he's actually carrying. You know, he's actually doing a pretty good job of humping that person out. And everybody's laying down some pretty decent cover fire to try to give him that clear, like, pathway to haul ass. And then of course, 
We blow a building up. What more can I say? And yes, we all know that wasn't actually Charlie Sheen that was running with the Michael Bean. Just so we're clear on that. All right, so let's take a look at the next scene. <laughs> so in this scene, which is one of my other favorite scenes, the getaway at the end of the movie where they're driving through the town <laughs> in a Mercedes going through pretty much everything. And you got to give credit to that Mercedes. Obviously, they probably had 30 different cars that they bashed during this film, but it was still pretty cool to see them actually doing the things that they did. Like, my criticism that I like to kind of remind folks about is, yeah, you would really never fire any type of rocket missile um, that close to friendlies because the back blast is, first of all, deadly, um, like really bad. Uh, I, I kind of joke, there was one time when I was the new guy and we had a stockpile of rockets that we had to get rid of. For whatever reason, we couldn't turn them back in. So as a new guy, it was my job to go ahead and crank all those things off. And I'm pretty sure I suffered concussions from doing as many rockets as I fired. It's like there's a limit that you can only fire and I think I exceeded it like, like three times or whatever. And what was really funny was at the end of the day when I am like totally shell shot from all the rockets that I fired, um, the, the back of my head, all my hair was burnt and my, uh, my cami jacket that I had on was singed because of all the back blasts. Because I fired them from every position, standing, kneeling, prone, behind something, over something, under something, you name it. They were like, hey, why don't you try shooting it like that? Or hey, maybe you should do it over like that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe I should because I might have to do that in real world. So, yeah, lesson learned on that one. They were probably back there just watching going, oh my God, like, this is gonna be so funny. But I literally burned all the hair in the back of my head. I wore a hat for like a month until it all grew back. It was so funny. Anyhow, so this scene right here, you know, they're getting chased and it's getting, you know, it's like up and down, up and down. Hey, we're ahead. Oh, we're behind. Oh, hey, we're ahead. And we just wrecked. And so now this is the scene where one of, uh, one of my favorite actors, Rick Rosovich, he's going to bail out of the vehicle and he's going to crank off that rock and destroy that armored vehicle chasing after them. Here it comes. Oh, oh, this like, oh, we're so close. Yeah, that back blast right there would probably fry everybody that is in close proximity. But hey, it's good for Hollywood. All right, let's check out the next scene. All right, so this is one of my other favorite scenes in the movie because there's some actual pretty good tactical employment of, uh, of teamwork here. So this is a scene where they are responding to, you know, fire and they get channelized into a narrow kind of street and as a result they have to return fire using what we call an Australian peel. And I'm going to tell you, like, the very first time that I got a chance to do an Australian peel for real, uh, well at least in the training scenario, I mean, it is so much fun because everybody's just doing mag dump and then peeling, mag dump and peeling, mag dump and peeling. And it's just this withering fire going down range. It's very channelized, it's very limited in scope because it's easy to flank and all this other business, blah, blah, blah. I get all that, but it doesn't mean that it's still not cool when you're doing it. Um, so I thought it was pretty neat to see it in a movie and see it depicted actually pretty well. Because there are some concerns like if you go the wrong way, how do you know you're the last man, when do you start shooting, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of chore choreographed kind of effort that you have to put into it in training in order to be able to do it in real. And these guys actually did a pretty good job of doing that. The other thing that I like is this is one of the first movies where the actors mounted the rifle up into their shoulder pockets to actually see their sights. Now, sometimes they actually use the stock. Other times they use the sling, and both methods actually at this time period were legit. So, you know, this was kind of like a pivotal shift in Hollywood um, production where they actually took a little bit more, they paid more attention to what, how we did things for real because they were trying to replicate that for real. So, Paul, let's play this clip here. All right, so here we're bailing and boom, we get contacted, right? We also got hostages that we're trying to rescue, and there we go. We start doing some pretty cool uh, peeling right there for just a couple of dudes, but it's enough to try to kind of like put the bad guy's heads down before you can do something. And so here, there's Chief. Nice gun mount there with that MP5 SD. Fun little gun to shoot. Another sling mounted shot there. Awesome, awesome. Oh, and then of course, we've got more sling mounted use there. So 
I mean, the Australian Peel came fast. It got him out of the choke point, and then you got a chance to see some pretty good display of actual like return fire using some pretty decent shooting techniques. All right, let's check out our next scene. So, in this scene, a couple things. First, I've got to give props to the guy driving the Jeep because for more than half my career, I had a CJ7 that I drove year-round with a bikini top. So, dead of winter, could be snowing, minus outside, didn't care. I just drove my Jeep anyhow. Uh, so that was kind of cool to watch, and I'm like, huh, I wonder if it was that obvious back then that most of the guys were driving Jeeps. Anywho, so this scene is the kill house scene where the uh, LT brings in the civilian reporter to try to coax some information out of her. And I'm, I'm thinking that, yeah, it's probably not the best way to try to extract some sort of information, put them in such a crazy scenario like live fire. Of course, this is Hollywood. It wasn't live fire, but you get the point. So, Paul, let's play this clip. So, here we are driving in our cool Jeep to get up to the kill house. And, you know, you got to get props. It's actually a pretty nice setup. It's actually this. This was back in the day when we used tires to construct the actual house. And it made no sense because the walls were so thick that you literally couldn't appreciate the depth there. Uh, you know, it, an internal wall, which should have been only yay big, was now several feet thick because of all the damn tires. And here the guys blow in, they start just doing all sorts of crazy stuff, and we got a lot of fun stuff happening here. You can see all the guys shooting their slings with the MP5Ks, and of course now there's the rejection. Not that I could, not that I could blame her, because that was kind of a dick move if you really want to try to gather information from somebody, that's not the best way to do it. I think you would have been a lot better off with a little bit more like wine and dine. Just saying, you know, not the world's leading expert on romance, but yeah, that was piss poor on his part. Anyhow, that was a pretty cool scene because, I mean, who doesn't like to work in a, in a, in a kill house? I mean, back then we called them kill houses. Now I think they're, um, I'm not even sure what the actual current term is, but it's gone through kill house, tire house, shoot house, to whatever we're calling it right now. Anyhow, pretty cool scene. Check it out. All right, so a couple things. First, I had a lot of fun. Yeah, this brings back some memories. Um, that time period was kind of important to me because there was a lot of stuff that was going on downrange that I was involved in, so I wasn't a part of, it, of the movie at all, but a lot of my teammates and a lot of um, other friends were. The, um, you know, like I said in the beginning, you got to put it in context. I mean, the movie was a recruiting movie. We were desperately trying to attract people to get them into the community. And what better way than to do what the big Navy had done with Top Gun, which was a huge, huge success as far as recruiting. Who didn't want to be a fighter pilot after that? So the same kind of thought process came in when they released this movie. Um, I'm not big on a lot of the military movies in a sense of like releasing sensitive information, but I do recognize that at the end of the day, we are in a bid to try to select the best for the, for the job, and that means throwing the biggest net out there and, and recruiting as many of the capable individuals we can. So I kind of look at most of those movies that way these days. All right, so I had a lot of fun critiquing this movie. Not like I haven't done it a thousand times before. I'm sure everybody at some point has done the same thing. Uh, yes, it's corny. Yes, it's kind of funny. Yes, it's old school, but it actually was real time for me because that is the generation that I was on active duty. So I'm Jeff Gonzalez. I'd love to hear your comments about your thoughts when you first saw that movie. And just keep in mind that movie was released in 1990. <laughs> so that's like over 30 years ago. Anyhow, I had a good time, folks. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll do some more of these videos as we... Um, critique other movies down the road. So until then, take care and stay safe.